Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bon Jovi, and I'm thrilled to be introducing our guest today, David Camp. David is an author, journalist, humorist, and lyricist. He's a longtime contributor to Vanity Fair, where he has profiled such cultural icons as Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. David is here with us today to talk about his new book, Sunny Days, The Children's Television Revolution That Changed America. This book examines the unique political and social moment that arose in late 1960s America. It looks at the confluence of opportunity, creativity, and passion that led to an extraordinary golden age of children's television. Not just Sesame Street, but also Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Milo Thomas's Free to Be You and Me, Schoolhouse Rock, The Electric Company, and Zoom, just to name a few. David expertly captures the unique time when an uncommon number of media professionals and thought leaders leveraged their influence to help children learn. David's book is clever and inspiring, and it's really a lot of fun. Now, throughout our talk today, you might have some great questions popping into your head. And when you do, please go ahead and add them to the YouTube chat on the right. We will have time shortly for David to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. But first, David, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matt. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I want to start by framing the conversation a little bit. And the 1960s saw really an incredible alignment of circumstances from the availability of federal funding for education, advances in cognitive psychology, a growing interest in early childhood development. And all of these things came together really to form the perfect environment for a revolution in the way TV approached children's shows. And your book really digs into some of these roots. So I'm hoping we can start with the woman who forms one of the centerpieces of your book, Joan Gantz Cooney. Who was she and what was she up to in the late 1950s when television in America was really finding its footing? In the 1950s, Joan Gans Cooney was a young woman from Arizona who had uh, finished college and she somehow intuitively and innately grasped the power of television, which is, was at the time a new medium. And even though she was from Arizona, she didn't have connections anywhere. She somehow thought, or she was also, there was a slight religious component. She was part of a group of, um, Catholics known as the Christophers, who are, were not, it was not so much about pushing their religious beliefs, but how can we, how can we use our, our beliefs to foster better understanding, to alleviate poverty? Mm -hmm. Somehow, Joan Cooney said, television, television is going to be the way to alleviate poverty and better educate people. And I just want to add, Matt, that in parallel to this, Fred Rogers, meanwhile, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, is another young guy, same age, basically, <laughs> who also says like TV, huh, TV is this amazing new medium. So both of them come to New York City as people in their 20s in the 50s. She ends up working for CBS. Fred Rogers ends up working for NBC. And there's a parallel world where those two might have stayed in network television. But because they saw their call to television as a calling, they both ended up in public television where they thought they could do more good. Yeah, and what was their vision for what television could be? Well, it's so weird, because you think now, why do people go into TV? And generally, you know, if you're thinking about people today, it's because they have stories to tell, whether as uh, reporters or, or as uh, scripted series creators. And let's be honest, it's also for the glamour, the money and the fame of it. Joan Gans Cooney and Fred Rogers went into TV to do good, <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, to basically make the world a better place, like pure altruism, which is kind of amazing, but equally amazing is how well they executed their visions. Yeah, definitely. And public television, I suppose, is not the place you would go for glory necessarily. Well, yeah, but it was still television. You know, television was still really new and glamorous. Right. And, um, and I think for Fred Rogers, like he really, he was on a track to become like an entertainment executive at NBC. You know, he. There's, a, there's there, again, a parallel world where he was programming Thursday nights. Like, I, I like the idea of a TV <laughs> show called Friends. I like <laughs> Friends are a nice thing. But, but, yeah, but, but then when uh, his hometown, uh, you know, Pittsburgh had WQED, a new public TV station, he went there. Joan Gans Cooney went, to, um, went from CBS to uh, the precursor of today's Channel 13 in New York, WNDT, because they thought, okay, let's be real. Public TV is where we're going to get our social mission stuff done. Right. And there was another piece of this puzzle in Lloyd Morissette. Can you tell us about him? Lloyd Morissette was a guy, a young guy with a psychology background working for the philanthropic Carnegie Corporation in New York. And he had a friend named Julian Gans, who just by chance was a good, was the cousin of Joan Gans Cooney. 
And so Julian Gant said, hey, you two would like each other. You should get together in New York. You know, young people in New York, it happens all the time to this day. They got together. And remember, Joan Gant Scooney, she saw television as a means to possibly alleviate the effects of poverty, shine a spotlight on poverty, and maybe you know talk about social programs that will help poverty. She was not, weirdly enough, interested in kids at that point. She didn't have kids. She wasn't thinking about working in children's programming. Lloyd Morissette at the Carnegie Corporation um, was working with developmental psychologists. It was kind of, um, the very phrase early childhood was a new concept in the early 1960s, early childhood development. That was all new back then. And so he was interested in that, but this kind of trial programs he was doing with the Carnegie Corporation, as noble as they were, the scale of them was really small. Like they would allot some of their, their, their grants to little trial programs for maybe a hundred kids. And so there's this dinner party where the two of them both go to this dinner party at Joan Gans Cooney's apartment with her husband and Lloyd Morissette's with his wife in 66, where they have this conversation and he's talking about how he wants to scale up his efforts on behalf of children, early childhood. And she's talking about how she wants to use TV to alleviate the effects of poverty. And it's one of those old Reese's peanut butter cup commercials where it's like, you put chocolate in my peanut butter. Well, you put peanut butter in my chocolate. Hey, it's a perfect match. They combine their two goals. And out of that, that was the embryonic uh, you know, idea of Sesame Street that took a good three and a half years to bring to fruition. Yeah, and so then at this same time, what was going on with the US government and what, how were they thinking about television and about education and all of these things? Well, their time, Joan and Lloyd's timing was really good because the 60s were a time of activist government um, and big government. You know, they, like first there was JFK um, and his uh, first chairman of the FCC was a guy named Newton Minow. And Newton Minow gave a speech to uh, the broadcasters when he was newly sworn in in 61 as FCC chair where he said, look, I'm on your side, guys. I like TV. I'm not anti-TV, but we can do so much better. And he had this kind of throwaway phrase where he said, at its worst, TV, when you look at the cowboy shoot 'em ups and the crappy soap operas and whatever, it is a vast wasteland. But it can be better. And he actually proposed, he articulated, why aren't there more shows for kids exposing them to the way other kids live and, 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 and to the news. He was basically proposing something a lot like what Sesame Street became, but the broadcasters took umbrage at his speech because all <laughs> they heard was vast wasteland. And they were really mad. They thought, who is this government guy to meddle in our affairs? And um, uh, uh, Sherwood Schwartz, who created Gilligan's Island, actually named the ship that gets wrecked, shipwrecked, the SS Minnow as a sort of middle finger to Newton Minow. <laughs> But the point is, Newton Minow's message was heard, and uh, even after JFK was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson's administration in initiated this bevy of huge social programs known as the Great Society, the War on Poverty, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Public Broadcasting Act. Basically, a lot of government money was suddenly being allotted to the very things that Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Morissette were interested in doing. Yeah. And at that time, what was Cooney and Morissette, how were they thinking about their goals in creating this show, specifically with trade-offs around funding for TV programs like theirs versus funding for schools directly um, through programs that you mentioned, things like Head Start and Title I and, and these other great society? Well, you know, they didn't see it as a trade-off, Matt. They actually, you know, Head Start kind of had the same goal as Sesame Street. Head Start was one of these great society programs that allotted money to basically inner city schools uh, where kids were not getting the preschool uh, experience that, that people, kids in more affluent communities were getting. So basically, uh, you know, the, the thinking back then is like Puerto Rican and black kids in New York City. That was who people like Joan Gans Cooney and Head Start were thinking about. And Head Start was just like, we're going to give you basically five or six weeks of preparatory school before kindergarten so that what you're now already behind you know, your, your counterparts in the suburbs when you start school. So they saw Sesame Street as a complement to that. And Sesame Street actually, again, it's about scale. No one foresaw how huge Sesame Street would become. Right. And that's the magic of it, that with just a TV show, a really good TV show, you could scale up these dreams and goals. Yeah, and at that time, Joan Gans Cooney was thinking specifically that she wanted a show that would target that same demographic of, of pre-kindergarten and, and helping them ease this transition into school? Yeah, or... in fact, her initial bullseye, to use the term she used, was four-year-old black kids in the inner cities. You know, whether it was New York City or Washington DC or LA, you know, it wasn't really meant to be a show for all kids, right. all preschool kids. She was really 
really focused on alleviating the effects of black poverty, but sort of the mandate expanded over time. And even though that was still her original goal, she very quickly recognized that, oh my God, this, this is gonna transcend my original demographic ideas. Yeah. And Sesame Street was really one of the first shows that was built on this idea of rigorous preparation and testing. What was the show's production team doing that was unique? Well, like I said before, it was three and a half years from that dinner party to November 10th, 1969, when episode one of Sesame Street airs. And there were all manner of preparation. They, there were seminars held by the Harvard uh, psychology expert, Gerald Lesser, where they had people from every walk of life just sort of spitball, um, like education people, entertainment people. Maurice Sendak was there. Charles and Ray Ames, who designed those fancy chairs, they were there discussing how can we come from a zillion different angles to create this TV show? And then once they had like clips to show, they were doing things like testing them. Like there was a chief of research named Ed Palmer who did formative research where they did had something called the distractor, which is basically uh, perpendicularly to the side while kids were watching Sesame Street test clips, there was basically a TV showing slides of other stuff that would <laughs> capture their attention to see how distracted, they, exactly. Like if they, if they pivoted, then you knew that, that the, the material wasn't holding their attention. They also did summative research, meaning after they broadcast a few episodes or a season, then they could go out and survey teachers and kids and you know parents and see what were the net effects. So the rigor with which this was prepared and then also the songwriting rigor and looping in Jim Henson and getting the Muppets involved. So again, yeah. this is like a battleship sized <laughs> operation just to launch this show. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it wasn't just the testing that was rigorous, it was also the effort that they were putting into getting Sesame Street to viewers and the viewers that they specifically wanted. Can you tell us a bit about that? I think this is so cool, they, their community outreach. They had a woman named Evelyn Payne Davis who was kind of their chief of community outreach. She came from the New York City Urban League and she kind of tapped people in similar positions in other cities to be outreach people. And you, because the idea was, you gotta remember, this is 1969. There's a lot of houses that simply don't have TV sets or if they do, they're black and white TVs or they don't get good reception because it's still the rabbit ears that you had to adjust <laughs> like this. And yeah. so the resourcefulness of Evelyn Payne Davis and her team, like they actually got some, like they got Con Ed, the utility, to actually like drive around Harlem and Bedford Stuyvesant with um, like TVs that would play uh, like reel to reel recordings of test episodes of Sesame Street. So I said they were literal promotional vehicles. <laughs> and another cool thing they did was like, look, not everyone has a TV. So where are you gonna get kids in the inner city to watch TV? It might be the common room in a housing project. It might be in a community center. It might be in a church basement. In Ward 8 of Washington, DC, which was then and still is kind of a poor district of Washington, DC, they got a guy who ran a 7-Eleven to make his 7-Eleven a community center. And they got uh, students, undergrads at Howard University to uh, you know, spread the word and recruit uh, mothers and their kids to come watch the show in the 7-Eleven. Right. And like, how unusual was this for a show at the time? Was this completely unheard of? Unprecedented, utterly unprecedented. I mean, that's the whole idea. And another thing they did was they there was a football game like a month before Sesame Street launched between Howard and no, between Grambling State and Morgan State, two historically black colleges at Yankee Stadium. And so they just passed out flyers, like 70,000 flyers to everyone at the stadium, just saying like, coming soon, the show called Sesame Street, because pre-internet, and you know, pre pre everything else, yeah. you know, you had to do it sort of like retail promotion, you know, like shoe leather promotion, and it worked. It works. Yeah. That's so amazing. Yeah, definitely. And possibly the single name that's most associated with Sesame Street is that of Jim Henson's. And in fact, getting him involved in the show was a bit of a coup. How did he come to be a part of Sesame Street? So the original showrunner of Sesame Street, the main producer was a guy named John Stone, who'd worked at Captain Kangaroo, another huge t children's TV show. Um, so Stone had a lot of, uh, and but Stone was also in like to, into the sitcom world. So a lot of entertainment expertise and a lot of children's programming expertise. And Stone had become friendly with Jim Henson on a previous project. And so when Joan Gans Cooney tapped John Stone, it's basically run Sesame Street. And I wanna say John Stone deserves a lot of credit too. He's the guy who made Sesame Street the show itself. Like he's the guy who said, I know what we'll do. We'll set it on a city block and it'll be on a stoop. Like that whole look, that kind of like brownstone look and the kind of garbage cans and the clothing lines and all that stuff. He knew Jim Henson. He said, we need some element of puppetry. And Jim Henson's the guy 
And Jim Henson didn't have to take this job at all. Jim Henson was not <laughs> desperate for the employment. Jim Henson was super rich. He was only 30, but he was already a millionaire because he was making a ton of money with his Muppets doing advertisements for Frito-Lay, for Wilkins Coffee, for La Choy canned Chinese food. He was making a ton of money, but John Stone approached him at a good moment because Jim Henson already had four kids, the youngest of whom was experiencing learning disabilities, uh, later diagnosed as dyslexia. And so Jim Henson, for the first time, was really thinking, how do kids learn? And um, like he was really systematic in breaking things down, like just the how of everything. He was thinking of getting out of the Muppets or maybe transitioning beyond the Muppets into doing the stuff he later did in the 80s, like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. But he put all that on hold because he thought, I, I wanna think about how kids learn. How can I be of assistance to this show? And his signing up was the coup because Sesame Street without the Muppets, I don't think would have, it wouldn't be around 50 odd years later. Yeah, yeah, like what was his impact on the spiritual and the visual identity of the show? Well, I think it also chimed with the times because the Muppets were kind of hippie and psychedelic, especially in those yes. days. <laughs> and so the idea that like you you had these monsters like, like uh, like Grover is technically a monster, Cookie Monster is a monster, but they're benevolent monsters. You have to think that back then that was kind of like weird hippie thinking, like <laughs> like gentle monsters. Loretta Long, who played Susan, who is the original uh, like matriarchal black human cast member, she tells me this funny story that you just, everyone watching here, you got to remember that we take for granted Big Bird, we take for granted Oscar the Grouch, but she told the story, but when she got her job, when she was cast in Sesame Street in 1969, she's really excited. She calls her parents back on their farm in Michigan. So think <laughs> about the visuals of this. She says, mom, dad, good news. I got cast in this children's show called Sesame Street. I'm gonna be sitting on a city block, a uh, city stoop, talking to a bright yellow eight foot tall bird. <laughs> and she said, the phone got real quiet. My mom <laughs> passed the phone to my dad. And dad said, yeah, but." what's your real job, honey? And she said, no, this is gonna be my real job. And she said, I'm so glad I didn't tell them about Oscar because she said, if I had said, and then this thing's gonna come out of a garbage can and yell at you, they actually thought she might've been on LSD having a hallucination or something. Like she said, like they were scared for her. So that's how novel and weird this was. And to go back to your original question, Jim Henson brought something so offbeat and original that that's part of why Sesame Street was so new and so uh, transformative and, and, and why it's so connected with little kids. Yeah, and what were Gantz, Cooney and Stone and, and them thinking about, like were they, they must have also recognized that this is, we're gonna have a brownstone and then we're gonna have these monsters. This is a bit loopy. Did they yeah, think a, that it would be fine or? Well, again, it was research. It was super research. So one of the things they actually found out with Ed Palmer's distractor is that the right. kids did get distracted when you, cause it used to be segregated. The Muppets were only in their Muppet sketches and then the stoop and street scenes were all human beings. And then they realized with the distractor tests that if you had just humans on the street, the kids got distracted, they pivoted <laughs> away. And right. so that's when they realized, oh, we can commingle the Muppets. We can have Ernie and Bert hanging out. We can have Big Bird walking around. And that's when they realized the gold of like, oh my God, if we combine these, we've got the best of both worlds. We've got human engagement and this kind of fantasy element too. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the storytelling was truly original. And so we have um, a clip that will show where basically there was this plot line where one of the original cast members, Will Lee, uh, who played the corner store owner, Mr. Hooper, he tragically passed away a few years into the run of the show. And instead of writing his character out or, or getting another actor to replace him, the show really just addressed it head on. And how did the bravery of some of plot lines like this really set the tone for Sesame Street to be a different kind of children's show? Well, Joan Gans Cooney always called it an experiment. You know, it, it wasn't launched with the notion of like, this is gonna be a long running sitcom like, like uh, Friends or Seinfeld. It was seen as an experiment. She actually thought in season one that there, there's a pretty good chance there won't even be a season two. And even that was actually uh, 12 years into Sesame Street's existence when that episode aired. But even then there was still this notion that we are an experiment. We're willing to uh, try things as audacious and, and crazy as they may seem. And in that one, when Will Lee died, there was a, they, they were at a crossroads. What do we do? Do we, um, we, could, we could write the character off the show and say he moved to Florida. We could simply recast him if another actor play Mr. Hooper. And they thought, no, this is useful because kids are gonna learn about death one way or another. And um, so that's when they came up with that plot. And again, I wanna go back to the idea of rigor, rigorous preparation. 
because of the way they uh, pre-filmed their, their episodes, they had a full year to prepare because he basically shot most of his episodes for that season that he died. So they had almost a year to test different notions of how they were going to approach this. And then another master stroke is they made a point of broadcasting that episode on Thanksgiving Day, 1983. So if a kid watching at home was scared or alarmed or confused, uh, he or she could turn to a loved one in the house because you know on Thanksgiving there'd be lots of family around. And, um, and you saw the cast members like Sonia Manzano crying real tears. So they were processing in real time too. And that's really useful for a kid to see that the, the adults are also getting sad about this. Yeah. yeah, and it's such an incredible pairing of this, this really thought out, rigorous, prepared thing, but then also just the true authenticity of, of having the cast members who are dealing with their real grief of this real man's passing. Yeah, and I think that's a tribute to John Stone, who I said is kind of an unsung hero. He yeah. was such a TV pro, but he also knew how to use looseness and improvisation. And I think that's kind of the magic of John Stone that you're seeing there. Yeah. So diversity and representation was quite intentionally at the very core of the Sesame Street identity. Why was it that a children's show in the 1960s was able to be so far ahead in terms of representation than many other shows at the time? Well, again, it was um, an experiment. So when you're experimenting, you're kind of free to like go for it and, and, and do things that people might not like and also to make mistakes. You know, part of, part of it's a learning curve where, you, where Joan Gans Cooney was really good and this is a great leadership thing. She was really good at saying, you know what, I'm wrong. I got it wrong. Like she would hear her employees and say, I kind of screwed up and got that wrong. And they, they were really after a black audience from the beginning. And in fact, when Sesame Street went on the air, I write in the book, it was the blackest show on television because it predated Soul Train and it predated uh, the black comedian Flip Wilson's variety show. And so you know, black people were so infrequently regulars on TV that in the late 60s, Jet Magazine, the Black Weekly, had a page, their back page was like, black people on TV this week. And it'd be like, <laughs> Michelle Nichols will be in a small part on Star Trek. Sammy Davis Jr. will be on the Merv Griffin show. And so for Sesame Street to come out of the blocks with uh, Matt Robinson as Gordon and Loretta Long as Susan, two regular black, black cast members who are on five days a week, that in itself was huge. But then two seasons in, um, a bunch of Hispanic organizations got together and not gently, kind of angrily, confronted Joan Gans Cooney and said, where the hell are we? You know, you're supposed to, be, you're trying to do representative TV and you're trying to show uh, a world that looks more like America, where the hell are we? And they, they were pretty, that, they, they were that blunt and almost adversarial, but she took the meeting and sometimes when you listen, you also have to hurt a little. You have to say, ooh, that hurts. It hurts to hear that, but if I think it through, you're right. And the result of that is that in the 1971 season, you introduced Sonia Manzano as Maria and Emilio Delgado as Luis, who became cornerstones of that show who were on for more than 40 years. It's so warm and inviting and it really- It's so warm, it's, it's also, it's my, it's my childhood, plus it's so idealized. It's so like, that's the world we wanna live in, isn't it? Yes, definitely. And is it fair to say that a scene like this was unusual for 1974, I think it was in the US? Absolutely, absolutely. You've gotta understand like, you know, to have Spanish language curriculum, um, and, and in two ways. One is if you're a brown skinned kid whose family speaks Spanish at home, you're watching this at home and you're saying, holy SHIT. Well, you're not saying that because you're a little kid. You're saying, golly, but you're watching this. There's someone who looks like me and speaks the language we speak at home. And you're actually seeing the white guy, Bob, and the black woman, Susan, and they're all, and the kids are all together singing it. So, but it's so validating if you're that uh, Latin American kid watching at home to say like, I exist. I exist, I am seen. And then by the same token, if you're like I was in 74, a little white suburban kid watching at home, you're being exposed to a language and a culture that you don't know about. And so right when you know Bob is singing, sing, sing a song, and then Luis says, canta, canta una canción, like that was the first time I ever heard those words. That's how I learned the word canta. And so it's like win-win, you know, because the, 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 the Latin kids feel represented and the non-Latin kids, whether they're black or white, say, oh, this is cool. This, this world, and I get it now. I, I'm beginning to get it now. Yeah, and it's it's so casual too, because like you said, Bob kind of starts singing, sing, sing a song, and then they just kind of go into it, and it's 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 just not a big deal. Which I it's think so chill and so welcoming, and that's why yeah. that's they were so good at that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, can you also tell us about the character of Roosevelt Franklin and what 
cast member Matt Robinson's goals were with that character and, and then touch on some of the controversy that that character um, that surrounds him. Right, and this, this goes back to the idea of experimenting and maybe not always getting things right um, because Roosevelt Franklin was a really atypical Muppet in that he wasn't dreamed up by Jim Henson, Frank Oz and their crew. Um, in the first season, Matt Robinson was playing Gordon, but he was also a writer and producer on the show. And Matt Robinson said to Jim Henson, you know, there should be one Muppet who kind of is palpably a black Muppet. And Jim Henson's initial reaction was, well, Muppets have no color, except the color of the felt they're made out of. <laughs> like, you know, you know, like uh, Bert's yellow and Ernie's orange and Grover's blue. And, but Matt Robinson had a good argument. He said, well, no, because if you think about it, like you guys are all white men. So the default setting for a Muppet, because you're developing the characters, is of a white guy or a white person. And Matt Robinson said, when a kid's Sesame Street watching age four or five, that's when he or she will kind of figure out that he or she is black. And that kid wants to you know, feel represented and feel good about himself or herself. And so he said, what if we developed a character who was like a little black kid? And so Jim Henson and his crew designed this little purple guy with a shock of black hair who spoke of this kind of pattery jive that um, Matt Robinson, he voiced him and Loretta Long voiced the mom. So you have, you have this character who like he's talking about he's, his, his manner and even like the way the mother was, this is Loretta Long who voiced um, the mother said to Jim Henson, you know, that's meant to be a black mom and the way you have that Muppet designed, like her body language is wrong. So I don't know if you noticed, but her left arm is pinned up like this because she learned along model that she said a, a black mom would be standing like this while she's talking to her son. So Jim Henson, again, listens, the value of listening and saying, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And so, and the way she did her neck roll, like that was all the right along saying, if you want it to connect with the black audience. Meanwhile, Questlove of the Roots, who wrote the foreword to my book, he told me the story. He was a five-year-old watching this in Philadelphia. And he sees this character, you know, with that voice singing about going to church and eating collard greens and hauling bricks. And he's like, oh, that's me and my family. I love this. I love this. So again, Matt, it's kind of a win-win situation where if you're a black kid watching at home, you feel really legitimized um, and you feel um, uplifted. Like the, here's a character like me or, or like my family. And then if you're, again, a non-black kid, you're just saying, this is so cool. I love this. And and you're learning how to count to, to 10 as well. So it's all, but, and there's a but to this story, which is that a lot of the more bourgeois people, black people who are executives at the Children's Television Workshop, which is uh, Joan Gans Cooney's production entity that made Sesame Street, they thought the character was too quote unquote street. And there was a lot of internal debate. Um, Jane O'Connor, who was a consultant for the show, a school teacher who also edited Sesame Street magazine, she, I found the minutes to a meeting where she said, we've been trying to get away from this image for years. Like this is too down market. And there was a big internal debate about is Roosevelt, and the, by the way, all the kids watching at home are oblivious. I loved every Roosevelt Franklin segment. <laughs> um, and I think kids across the board did, but it was just seen among the adults as too controversial. And Matt Robinson was really peeved that it was even thought of as controversial. In this case, Joan Ganscuni listened to the anti-Roosevelt side and took their side. She, you know, she was trying to be a good listener. And in my opinion, she chose the wrong side, but I also get why you would have uh, felt that pressure back then. Right, and so they did eventually phase out that character. He was phased out. And I think here, there may be, we may be on the cusp of a Roosevelt Franklin revival because I've been watching some new Sesame Street episodes and he hasn't had speaking parts, but he kind of makes these little cameos where he walks right. on. And you're like, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so Sesame Street obviously touched on, on so many different areas, uh, but the 1960s and 70s, they were also an important time for feminism in America. Can you tell us about Marlo Thomas and how she, like Cooney and Morissette, also saw a way for media to shape America for the better? Yeah, this was a time of activism. I mean, that's a cliche, but it really was true. You had anti-war activism, you had anti-racist activism, and you had the feminist movement happening in a big way. And when Marlo Thomas finished the sitcom that made her name, That Girl, she was kind of restless and wanted to get away from being that girl, you know, the cute, the cute, you know, lovelorn or looking for a husband woman on that show. And she said, like, I want to, and she was friends with Gloria Steinem. She wants to put her activism to use. And basically, oh, she had a niece 
who she was looking to get books for, and the books were all so gendered, like little girls like pink and flowers and boys like dirt and baseball. And she was, <laughs> she was as an ardent feminist repelled by this. So she dreamed up, initially it was just a record album, it later became a book and a TV special, but a record album called Free to Be You and Me, in which it was basically a radical feminist primer on gender for little kids. And again, like the culture in the late 60s and early 70s was more open to this. It wasn't seen as this like really horrible culture wars provocation that would rend the country asunder. There was amazing buy-in. And when Free to Be You and Me became a success as an album and a TV special, that stuff was then incorporated into the curricula, public school curricula of 35 of our 50 states. So again, the level of buy-in back then was awesome and amazing too. Yeah. Yeah, that is quite extraordinary. And you touched on it there about how a lot of this in today's world might be a bit more controversial. Was it controversial at the time or, or did it just kind of go down without any notice? Inevitably, it was controversial. And in fact, when Sesame Street uh, first aired um, in Mississippi, uh, public TV people didn't want to put the show on the air because of its mixed right. cast. Um, and basically, they were shamed into doing it because once the news spread, that that was the reasoning. You know, there was such a nationwide outcry that they, Mississippi turned around. But actually, I, I think more of the controversy was what I would call left on left controversy, where kind of what I described with Roosevelt Franklin, where some people thought that Sesame, Sesame Street wasn't progressive enough, or if you're showing an urban setting, make it more decrepit like maybe it was too sanitized, even though you had dented garbage cans and graffiti that you needed to show drug addicts on the street. And what's funny is that uh, Jerry Lesser, that, uh, that psychologist at Harvard who I mentioned earlier, he wrote a book five years into Sesame Street's run where he talked about how they actually considered making Sesame Street, the street itself more sordid and more garbage strewn. But he thought, you know, our research didn't bear it out that like a kid would want to watch that. Like that's right. going too far, but yeah, there was there was a lot of criticism that you know it wasn't it wasn't left enough. But all that said, I'm still amazed at the level of buy-in. It was just a different time, a more activist time. I think the closest we've gotten to it is right now. Kind of, um, I think Gen Z is being super activist in a way that reminds me of the young people of the late '60s and early '70s. So I think we might be circling back to an era like that. Yeah. Yeah, and if we can jump ahead to today, what's the state of Sesame Street specifically today? Well, you know, it's, it's they're still doing God's work. Like I tip my hat to, uh, it's now called the Sesame Workshop, not the Children's Television Workshop. But they're doing shows now where they have an autistic Muppet to teach kids about neurodiversity. And South African Sesame Street had an HIV positive Muppet to teach kids about that experience. And you have resource deprived Muppets. You, you, you have all these lessons and they're still doing amazing stuff. That said, the show, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, is now on HBO. Um, because in order to make it survive and make it uh, economically sustainable, in the old days, they could make a ton of money through DVD sales and soft toys and record albums. And we know like soft toys maybe, yeah, but DVDs and record albums are not really a thing anymore. So that revenue stream dried up. So for Sesame Street to exist now, and also original Sesame Street was half funded by the federal government. That's not about to happen either anymore. <laughs> or maybe down the road, who knows? So, you know, the deal was for Sesame Street to survive, it's going to be on HBO Max. Now, the optics of that may not be ideal because that's a premium streaming service. And, you know, this is still a show that primarily, you know, you want to reach, not primarily, but at least partially want to reach uh, the most uh, disadvantaged or, or resource deprived viewers. But the deal they struck is, the shows are exclusively on HBO for nine months, and then they kick over to public television. And it's not ideal, but it's better than no Sesame Street at all. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what you mentioned there is quite striking, which is that the federal government was funding kind of half of the show's budget in those early years. And without that, it really can't have the same existence that it did back then. Right, unless we somehow engineer ourselves back into a mindset that we had in the early 70s when there was a kind of greater tolerance of the idea of uh, activist government or big government or even just federal aid for noble goals. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so today, obviously, the, the pandemic is, is on everyone's mind. What impact do you see the pandemic having on our approach to childhood education and specifically interactions uh, with screens and TV and media like that? Well, the pandem pandemic exposed how broken a lot of our systems are 
our uh, our healthcare systems and our our educational systems. And the way this this muddled improvised response we had uh, in March and April of 2020 of like remote distance learning and Zoom school. And I feel so bad for the teachers, the parents, and the students um, with young kids, fortunately mine are college age, but <laughs> th that, who had to muddle through that in an improvised fashion without the rigorous, I keep using that word rigorous, prep, the term rigorous yeah. preparation. We need, because we know, we know that for at least a generation, this pandemic is gonna be in the back of our minds and we're gonna be thinking about COVID variants and will we have mini lockdowns, maybe not as bad as what we had. We know we need a better system for distance learning. It's never gonna replace uh, in-person learning, which is the best kind of learning, but some hybrid is on the table forever, I think. And so I think we might need another battleship sized uh, project like early Sesame Street. We had this intensive preparation, not just from the educational standpoint, but from the entertainment standpoint to maintain the interest and to give teachers and students and parents a leg up. So it's not just, uh, you know, hey, we're on Zoom, what do we do now? Right. And also that it's not just, here's, here's Sesame Street, watch this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a good opportunity. In fact, it's to say screens can be used to teach. If you read David Camp's book, Sunny Days, you can learn how they did it. And yeah. uh, we've got to apply. I mean, seriously, that was a thought of mine was uh, how can we apply the template of something that worked really well then to now? Because like the circumstances are different, but in a way they're weirdly the same. Right. Yeah. So we have some really great audience questions coming in. Sure. Um, so why don't we jump to some of those? Great. So our first question is from Farah and she asks, uh, "Thanks, thank you for coming, David. What was one of your favorite aha moments when being a character member in Sesame Street's viewing audience? Well, a charter member. A, a charter, charter member, member. sorry, yeah. Um, well, one, one, I like how she said, aha, because it made me think of the count <laughs> going, ah, ah, ah. And yeah. I, I, think, I think part of it is, um, Farah, thank you for the question. It is that idea of, um, oh, as a kid, the charter thing was honestly learning about diversity. Although my little, you know, four-year-old mind would have thought of it in those terms, but it was this whole idea of like, oh, like you know, my generation, we thought it was always going to be this way. We didn't realize that what we were watching was radical. We just thought, hey, th we just took it on board that like this is the way the world looks. That that we we are we are a mix of people. We're Native Americans. Like Buffy Saint Marie was on the show, um, breastfeeding her child, no less. And we're, we're like so, and black kids and and Latino kids. And the uh, the aha as an adult, um, to extend Farrah's question, is simply that this was not done without friction, and that there was a lot of um, fumbling and 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 uh, mea culpa. We got it wrong, and now we're going to try to get it right. So that was kind of a cool thing to discover. Yeah, yeah, because even rewatching those clips, I think even, I mean, this is many decades later and it's still quite striking as we were saying. Yeah, yeah. So we have another question from Jenna who asks, this is so great, David, thank you for sharing. What do you think about the advent of mobile and interactive gaming for children? I think it, it has the potential to be wonderful in the same way we ask, can screens be used to teach? A lot of the same questions people worry about now, like our iPads and mobile gaming turning kids into zombies, the Children's Television Workshop had that fear too, within. It wasn't just their critics. They thought, what if we just turn kids into screen hooked zombies? But if the programming is researched enough and vibrant enough so that it doesn't feel passively received, but it's interactive and engaged. And by the way, Fred Rogers in his mellow way was also really good at this. Simple, something like mobile and interactive gaming can be put to that use, but it can't be casual and it can't be done without educational consultants. I hate to say it, but you've got to put a lot of time and effort <laughs> into it. Yeah. Yeah, and even Sesame Street and some of the shows that came after had this interactive element as well, that it wasn't just, you weren't just watching something, you were involved in, in the show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Even the very idea of talking to the screen. And also, when I keep talking about Fred Rogers, because he wasn't just saying, now let's count to three. He was, he was actually talking to the camera about what do you feel? What do you do with the mad that you feel? You know, asking questions like that. So he was actually engaging kids one-to-one -one on an emotional level. And that's another kind of thing. It's a little lost in children's TV, That that was part of his magic. Yeah, definitely. So we have another question. Um, this one's from Alan who asks, what was something that surprised you when you were doing your research and writing your book? I think I kind of answered it when I was talking to Far answering Farrah's question was the level of um, acknowledgement of mistakes and, and um, you know, it's a popular thing, uh, term these days, kind of post uh, last, this time last year when we were having the George Floyd Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations. 
Um, everyone was saying we have to do a better job of listening. And I've seen a lot of corporate statements where we say like, we stand with um, the BIPOC and API communities and it's kind of, and we will do a better job of listening. It's framed in this very somber way, but I don't love the framing because it shouldn't be somber or solemn. It should be joyful. And that's what was so great. That did surprise me a little is how joyful they were in saying like, oh, it's not time to don the hair shirt and say, we done wrong, we're so sorry, we're so, so sorry. It was joyful. Just if you go back to that clip we showed of Luis singing Kanta while Bob sang Sing and Susan is sitting there singing along with him. That is like a joyful way of listening and acknowledging we need to do a better job. And that result is so joyful. And that was kind of a surprise, like just the steps it took to get from, from point A to point B there. Yeah. Yeah, so we have another question uh, from Carol who asks, hi, David, thanks for this talk. Thinking about today's children TV landscape, what would you still like to see? What's missing or could be as groundbreaking as Sesame Street was back then? I still think we need more early childhood programming. Like back then when I was a kid, we had Sesame Street and then you got the sibling program, the electric company, which is when you're a little older and you can graduate to learning how to read. Like you'd learn the alphabet, you'd learn how to count to 20, you knew shapes and stuff. But then the electric company with Rita Moreno and Morgan Freeman and all these other great people, they came on and they taught you how to read. And that's kind of, that's, it's sort of like a Thursday night NBC slate of programming. I wish that there was this rigorously prepared, I'm saying it again, slate of children's TV programming specifically for early childhood that would kind of take the heat off of kindergarten and uh, pre-K teachers a little to say, hell, hell yeah, we're just gonna put this up on screen. And it's not this passive exercise. It's not the teachers fobbing everything off on the TV. We're working with you because the early Sesame Street and Electric Company, part of it was that they also had uh, program guides for teachers so they could use this material in the classroom and then work off of, okay, you've just seen that. Now let's pivot to what we're doing in the classroom. And I don't think that exists to that extent today and I wish it did. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then another question we have, which kind of builds on that, uh, Megan asks, bumping up the prior question to TV targeted at all audiences, do you have any ideas on how TV and cinema can be more representative today and created as rigorously as Sesame Street was? Look, you just listen. I mean, just, again, it's going about don't, listening, but not in that solemn way, listening with joy and saying like, okay. And I was thinking about, I, I write for Vanity Fair and I remember when Kelly Marie Tran was in The Last Jedi and how the readers of my article said, oh, that there's, a, there's an Asian cast member in Star Wars. This is so huge. And I thought, That's wonderful, but it's also kind of sad that you know, 50 years later, it's still a big deal. And I think that's, but that's the problem too. The opportunities have to be there. I think part of it is this moment we're having where it's not hard folks. And it's also, it doesn't have to be joyless and solemn. Let's go back to that sing clip yet again. That shows you how it's done, which is that you just listen to people, you bring in writers, you bring people at the executive level who are AAPI or BIPOC, who are white too. And you bring them all together and say, this is how it's gonna work. It's really not hard, it's just, it just, you're coming, you have to overcome a lot of intransigence among like um, people who are used to doing it one way. Right. And especially in the beginning of Sesame Street, we talk a lot about how it was a influence of many factors and there was quite a lot of serendipity in, in sort of Jim Henson being in the right stage of life and all of that. Yeah. Is something similar needed today where we just need kind of this, this crazy alignment or do you think there are other ways of approaching it? Well, I think, I mean, the way, all the ways that I've articulated and that are kind of really laid out in the book, they're equally applicable today. That said, no doubt, you need some magic. Like um, Joan Gans Cooney said she had two geniuses on the show, Jim Henson and Joe Raposo, who actually wrote that song, Sing. He was the guy who wrote a lot of Sesame Street's most famous songs, like It's Not Easy Being Green, which, which Kermit sang. And Joan Gans Cooney said you had two bona fide geniuses, not like lip service geniuses, but actual creative geniuses working on that show, which is part of the serendipity, as you put it, of it all coming together. And no doubt, like that's true of any show though, like Saturday Night Live worked because you had John Belushi and Gilda Radner, like you had the right group of people. And so that's kind of, you know, you're gonna need a little magic dust sprinkled on it too. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so it, it looks like we're just about out of time. David, I wanna thank you again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Oh, it's been a joy. I, I'm, as you can see, I'm really uh, in a positive way evangelistic about this stuff. Yeah, definitely. So David's book, Sunny Days, is available now wherever books are sold, uh, but including at your local and independent bookseller. Uh, the book's definitely insightful, and it's also kind of this warm hug of nostalgia, so I really recommend it. And, and Matt, I just want a, a word you used in the introduction for which I'm so grateful. It's fun. 
Like I didn't yes. write it to be a solemn book. It's history, but it's fun. And I'm so glad you said it was fun. Absolutely. I think you definitely hit that. So for everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Please stay safe and take care. Take care.